Okay, well, I would like to welcome everyone to my very first live chat, and I'm joined here with Dr. Mark Bilby, and today we're going to be talking to you a bit about Marcion. But just to introduce ourselves, um, first of all, I'm Dr. David Litwa. Mark and I have the interesting um, fun fact that we both got our PhD from the same place, which is the University of Virginia. Mark was well ahead of me, however, and um, we both worked with the same advisor, Dr. Harry Gamble. Um, and although our paths didn't cross, it's been a real pleasure to me to see Mark doing some fantastic research on Marcion, and particularly the text of Marcion's gospel and his text of Paul. So that is one of the reasons we've gotten together, and we have decided to just do a short presentation, just five to 10 minutes each on the sort of things that we've been working on with Marcion. And we want to generate interest and we want people to come along and ask questions, basically. And um, we will go from there. So, um, Mark, did you have anything to add? I want to give you time to also add things about your bio. Yeah, yeah. I, you mentioned the UVA connection. That's a fun one. Um, I also worked with Judith Kovacs there as well, um, who's a, a mentor to me. But we both, I think, also said the common out. We were in the same program of Judaism, Christianity, and antiquity. So we're studying rabbinics and New Testament and Tanakh and classics all together. So I think both of us had the commonality of taking a substantive portion of our coursework in the classics department and then benefiting from that sort of cross fertilization of disciplines. So that was really good. We actually did interact a little bit at SBL, which I think it was 2019 in San Diego. I gave a presentation on Suetonius as potentially oh. uh, an influ influence on the Lucan nativity story. And we went back and forth. Well, you, were, you asked me a question in the, from the audience about that, as I recall. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's that's right. Yeah. So I, I neglected that or, or it slipped my mind. Um, well, that's okay. Um, We've been running in similar circles, but in different different dimensions, I suppose. Right, and now we we are here, um, and I'm so glad to have you, and I'm so glad um, that others are able to join us. And hopefully, I've done this right. This is again, folks, my very first time doing a live stream, and we're we're doing it from Zoom at the moment. And so I hope all of you are able to find it and uh, and join us. Um, as we're talking, uh, you can send us questions uh, either through the chat or if you want a super chat, obviously we can get to, um, we'll get to the super chat questions first, but feel free to ask us anything. Obviously this is on Marcion, so this is your chance to talk about what interests you in Marcion, but I don't want to limit uh, anyone in that respect. So what I'd like to talk about in my, five or ten minutes or so is a bit of Marcion's biography and what we can know about this. And most of this comes from my rereading of Tertullian's great work against Marcion, the biggest attack on Marcion probably that was ever written. And thankfully, it's one of the very few that survived. And Tertullian calls Marcion a uh, now clarum, which is a shipmaster. And this is a bit different than being a a ship captain. A ship captain is the guy who pilots the ship, whereas the ship master owns the ship or, or multiple ships and ensures them and entrusts them to others, both pilots and crew to sail. So in other words, Marcion had a shipping business and to build such a business, he must have had some inherited wealth in his family. Perhaps he inherited the whole shipping business from his father, we don't know. But we do know that shipmasters did well in antiquity, and there were associations of, of shipmasters. Um, if you've heard of uh, the new book by Kloppenburg, Christ Associations, this is one of those many kinds of associations in the ancient world that you could join 
if you were a shipmaster. And these groups had meetings in cities throughout the Greco-Roman world, and they set up monuments in which they showed how they spent the excess of their profits. So a lot of these people were wealthy. Now, we don't know much about Marcion's life before he came to Rome. According to Tertullian, again, Marcion's first act on coming to Rome was to make a large donation to the church network there. And there was no unified church at Rome at the time, but enough of the house churches had networked so as to probably, I'm speculating a bit here, but to set up some kind of common fund for the poor widows and orphans in the city about a century later, we actually get some data on how the Roman church was supporting the, the poor. Uh, and we can probably uh, infer that that kind of activity was going on several decades earlier. I suspect that Tertullian's source for this donation that Marcion gave to the, the Roman church network was probably his introductory letter um, it might have been a letter of recommendation comparable to Paul's letter to the Romans. Tertullian unfortunately doesn't quote or summarize this letter. He he just mentions it. And the point that he notes is that it, Marcion in this letter showed himself to be perfectly in accord with Tertullian's own Catholic faith. So Tertullian then made the inference that originally Marcion was basically a Catholic, or we might say given the second century, an incipient Catholic. Now, it's telling that Marcion could present his faith in such a way that it was completely orthodox, even to a third century Catholic writer. Throughout against Marcion, Tertullian's polemic consistently exaggerates the differences between Marcionite and Catholic Christians, differences which must have seemed small to outsiders, and many of them may have emerged in the 40 plus years between Marcion's death and Tertullian's time of writing. Initially, at least, Marcion seemed like an incipient Catholic. Incipient Catholic congregations at Rome were at least glad to receive Marcion's money. So how then do we explain Marcion's later break with the Roman leadership and the return of his funds? Well, I think here there are two points to keep in mind. Again, this is all from Tertullian, and he's probably reading Marcion's initial letter, which may have been a kind of letter of introduction to the Roman churches in which Marcion may not have revealed all of his theology. Like any intelligent writer, he would have kept back points that he knew seemed controversial. And the other thing to note is that Marcion's break with other church leaders in Rome seems to have occurred over a period of several years. So if Marcion came to Rome about the end of Hadrian's reign in 138, and he started his independent church movement in July of 144, which is a date that Tertullian also gives, then we can speculate that, yeah, it took about six years, uh, over half a decade for any kind of rift to develop. And during this long Roman sojourn, Marcion likely developed his theology and view of scripture. It's the place where he probably created his Kine Diatheke or his New Testament. And he may even have been radicalized when he observed how Roman Christians focused on the Old Testament as scripture and didn't highlight the importance of Paul, at least, you know, from Marcion's perspective. And uh, I'll just finish up with this uh, donation. It was a large one, uh, 200,000 sesterces was enough to buy a fairly sizable house in, in Rome. And I suggest that by this donation, Marcin may have tried to follow in Paul's footsteps. If you remember in uh, 2 Corinthians and other places, Paul talks about the collection. And he apparently was trying to smooth his way into the favor of Jerusalemite Christian leaders by offering a Gentile collection of money for poor Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. And so judging from Galatians, there were theological and personality conflicts between Paul and the so-called pillars, and a healthy injection of gold could no doubt soften the hearts of even open critics. And these critics could then learn at least to tolerate Paul because he was such a big donor. Essentially, I know that sounds a little bit cynical, but that seems to be what's going on. And Paul could, in a sense, force their hand here, because if the Jerusalem leadership accepted money from Gentiles, then they would have to accept, at least on some level, the legitimacy of Paul's Gentile or non-circumcising mission. So returning to Marcion, if, if you know, we're not told that he ever earmarked his donation for a particular purpose, but I suspect that he didn't want his donation going to line the pockets of powerful church leaders or to build a church building. In fact, 
they didn't have any church buildings uh, in the mid second century, uh, not that I know of at least. Probably Marcin wanted the money to go to the the poor. And in this respect, Marcin would have been a genuine follower of his own gospel. If you remember uh, Jesus, um, you know, one of his most famous sayings is, go sell all you have and give to the poor. And three times in Marcin's gospel, Jesus says, give your possessions as alms and everything will be pure for you. And the one who doesn't renege all his possessions cannot be my disciple. And he tells the uh, one, some a law expert that sell all you have and give to beggars and you'll have treasure in heaven. Now, to be sure, Marcin isn't selling all his possessions and giving to beggars, but I believe this is one strong indication that Marcin was trying to follow the gospel commands in his own way. As a shipmaster, he was well off and he generously gave the Roman churches so that they could afford to protect the poor for years to come. Now, of course, Marcin also wanted to gain power and authority in his adopted church network by gilding his entrance with gold. But I think one can't impugn his other motives. And for me, at bottom, Marcin is a follower of Christ, whatever else he was. And he had a gospel in which Christ commanded the radical redistribution of wealth. So I think when Marcin comes to Rome, the first thing that he does is try to fulfill that command. So that's my mini presentation. I'm now going to hand it over to Mark. Uh, all this, again, is to design just to, as food for thought, you know, preparing you for, for questions. So share those. You can post those in the chat already, and, and we will get to them soon. Yeah. I'm also working through Tertullian, and um, it's the, the angle is a little bit different, but it is interesting that he really is our earliest major source for most of this stuff. I think that's important to note. We have little bits, little tiny bits from Irenaeus uh, that that have come down to us through fragments, usually just in Latin. And Origen, who is a little later than Tertullian, but Tertullian really is the the mainstay where we need to be looking for traces of Marcion. Though I do, I do tend to go back to Justin Martyr and his first apology as our first really solidly anchored historical reference to Marcion, which the first apology was written around 152. And he refers to Marcion uh, there as an old man and starts to criticize his belief. So at least gives us some some semblance of how uh, Marcion was received uh, by some some pockets of uh, Jesus followers in Rome around the mid second century. Um, and it's it's interesting uh, even too. It's it's interesting to frame Marcion in terms of the, thinking about one quotation of Tertullian I looked at recently uh, was mentioning that he wrote the first that. Uh, Marcion inherited Galatians, and Tertullian calls it the first work against Judaism. I just found that to be a fascinating way of describing Galatians. You know, I've never, I never, uh, you, you know, there are different various ways you can read Galatians, but reading it as the first sort of adversus Judaeus tract, um, that that may be a little bit reminiscent of what you know Justin Martyr was doing later too. But my my interest in Tertullian has been mainly in what evidence does he give us to put together what Marcion's scriptures were? And, um, you know, I'm certainly not alone in looking through that text very carefully to try to, you know, piece together what Marcion's scriptures were. Um, but I've, you know, tried to count all these up and take stock of them. And, and I'm, I'm engaged in the middle of that project right now, um, helping out Marcus Vincent to go through all the, the attestations that he has Put together in his forthcoming critical edition of Marcin's Apostolos, and I'm I'm adding in some more for his consideration. So other other places perhaps in Tertullian's work that might be the basis to give us some of Marcin's scriptures of uh, particularly the Paul's letters in this case, um, but I've already done something similar for the Evangelion, and uh, this kind of goes together with what Jason Badoon's interest was in the text. It's kind of broadening out the sources, thinking thinking in a broader way about where traces of the Marcionite scriptures might be living. So Jason has, has a nice contribution to an episode recently on Jack Bull's podcast, Patristica. He was a, a guest during that time, during that episode. And he talks about, you know, expanding out, for instance, to the, the Acts of Archelaus, who was, uh, this was a, a tract, uh, an anti-Manichaean tract, but it was probably built on an earlier anti-Marcionite tract. And it happened to use like uh, pretty much all of its references to the scriptures or, or many of them at least 
seem to coincide with the Marcionite scriptures. So when when a critic of the Manichaeans happens to be quoting all the same scriptures that show up in another tract that is anti-Marcionite, like such as the Adamantius dialogue, if you read through that text, most of the time we don't you know some of it. It could be from the canonical form of the text, but some of the uh, a lot of the time. It seems to be a debate over the Marcionite forms of those texts. Um, so I, I'm interested. It's 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 a challenge, and you know, it, sometimes it goes challenged in uh, by even legitimate scholars who just think that we can't reconstruct these or we can't reconstruct them with any any amount of confidence at all. So I'm, I'm interested in taking more of a a scientific, almost forensic kind of reconstruction process of thinking about this as like a broken record, not a broken record that just keeps playing playing, but uh, you know, seriously degraded recording from antiquity. And if if we were to find, you know, if you if you walk down the the street and you found a, you know, a record from you know a, an original Beatles album, but it had been like rotting in the sun for seventy years, could you reconstruct some of the the notes or many of the notes on that? You know, using kind of forensic techniques. So that's the kind of way I think we should come at these texts that we we can't maybe piece together 100% of the data that's there, but there's a lot of data that we can restore because not only is there an original recording, it's real, but it, it echoes and gets sampled and resampled and resampled and resampled, often in hostile modes, but just because it's hostile doesn't mean it's not a resampling that, that you know, really does reference uh, an earlier text. So, and this is where I think, you know, David's work is really important because he's helping us get past the polemical the the heavily overtly polemical ways that the, um, the orthodox apologists depicted marcion and um, help us to get a more sort of real life realistic um, picture of him i'm interested in the same kind of thing and that's partly why i've, I've brought together in some of my publications an open science book as well as a uh, claremont press book is that we need to think about marcion and Pliny, Pliny the younger uh, really in the same context. We, we should be thinking more about Pliny and what's happening in Bithynia Pontus in the early second century. And then Pliny's social network, which included a guy named Tertullus, Julius Cornutus Tertullus, which is, the, to me, this is really fascinating figure in Acts named Tertullus, who shows up in Acts 24. He's an opponent of Paul. He's a lawyer. Well, it turns out Pliny's one of his best friends and his successor as governor, Bithynia Pontus, was named Tertullus. And it's a pretty rare cognomen when you look at the epigraphical evidence. So you look at, uh, I have a chapter on Pliny in a, a book that Kloppenberg and Verheiden edited, where I look into those kind of connections. Pliny was also very connected to Tacitus and Suetonius. All these guys knew each other. Um, you know, uh, Pliny was a consul suffectus in the, in the Senate of Rome in the year 100, together with Tertullus. Um, so I see Luke and Acts as coming out of that post-Pliny world, but I also see Marcion as coming out of that Pliny world, and and he's aware of, and and helping maybe to, he's either part of or he, helping to shape a kind of messianism. And I, I would I don't I'm sort of the late parting of the ways view here. I don't think Christianity is a distinct, complete social organization in the in the first, mid first or late late first century. I think it was a gradual parting of the ways and it, it didn't happen all at once and it didn't happen all at once in one place or, or something like that. So um, I, I see Pliny as dealing with Christiani or Christiano, Christianus as Messianics and um, and Marcion is really helping to put express a form of Messianism and, and a network of Messianism that was not as hostile to the Roman Empire as maybe previous iterations of messianism was and that was probably overtly opposed to the campaign of simon bar kokhba but i see marcionism as sort of a form of an anti bar kokhba and maybe anti kitos war form of messianism um, that arose but that, that doesn't mean it's not without earlier sources and that jesus might not have taught something like non-retaliation um and that sort of thing but that maybe that was too much too much ground to cover but i think there's some interesting connections between our work and i think the main priority is is getting past the stereotypes about Marcion and getting past the the radical, really, I would say it's like faith biased uh, dismissals of Marcion and his scriptures, and just trying to get to know this person in a historical way, d doing critical historical inquiries and critical textual inquiries to try to get to know what was really going on in these social networks 
in the early to mid second century. And, and the Orthodox narrative might not, you know, the, the narrative that Irenaeus gives us is that there was only really one form of Christianity and, you know, all the others are these crazy deviations and, and so on. And, and so the, the picture we get from them is not going to be a very reliable picture in terms of doing, doing critical historiography. Excellent. And, you know, let's not forget, this is the guy, Marcion, this is the guy who gives us the first New Testament, okay? Um, so he's super important. And if you're going to judge his doctrine, the rule is don't judge him by the heresiologist. Judge him by his own gospel, because that's what he's going to try to follow first. Okay, there's a lot of negative press, a lot of yellow journalism that you'll see against Marcion. But the key to becoming a good critical reader of the sources is look at his gospel, look at the Apostolicon, that is his collection of Paul's letters, and Mark, along with others like Jason Badoon and Marcus Vincent, um, are absolutely key players in giving us a reconstructed version and of getting that those texts right. Marcin's Gospel is always a reconstruction, folks. Don't let anyone tell you that we have it or we found it. Uh, it's always a scholarly reconstruction, okay? And there are good ones and there are bad ones. And thanks to Mark's work, as well as the work of other scholars who are spending years and years and years of their lives, years of their lives, folks, day in and day out, trying to look up the sources, look up all the quotes for Marcion's text. This has taken sweat and blood, but this is going to soon become accessible to all of you. Now, um, we have some uh, we have some questions. Um, so I, I just want to thank everybody. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Silva. I'm going to butcher your first name, so I'm not going to save it for the super sticker. And for Derek and uh, others who have sent through super chats, um, some of these uh, are going to be on Marcy and some are not. That's perfectly okay. Let me get to Derek first. Uh, happy New Year to you as well. He says, uh, hey, gentlemen, if Marcion's gospel was first, what are the implications? And I want to let Mark have the first dibs on this one. Yeah, I think the implications are huge uh, because um, most of New Testament studies as we know it, most of early Christian studies as we know it, have labored under the assumption uh, of Irenaeus's program or model uh, for this, that, that Marcion is a late person, He's a derivative person, he's a heretical person, and he's a person who was chopping up and chopping down earlier texts that we consider that he considered to be the canonical texts. But if you flip the script and you see Irenaeus, who's the first guy to mention the name Luke as the author of the third gospel, the first guy to talk about a four gospel canon and give up like a robust ideology around that. Um, if we flip the script and uh, and just look at the textual evidence, then it, 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 things turn very differently. So uh, one example, right? so I've, I've done an English translation of a, of a preliminary edition of Marcus Vincent's version of the Apostolos. And, and I'm working with Badun too, so I've turned his old Greek, I've turned his English version into a Greek version that Jason's going to go back through and conform it to what his understanding is of the Greek. So I've done a first, first draft now and critical apparatus of that. So that's done. So I'm now now I'm able to compare, okay, what's what's Vincent finding? And then what's Badoon finding? And then where do we see, you know, and, and they're pretty much in agreement. They're both, uh, I mean, there are differences for sure, meaningful differences. But in terms of the overall content, we're talking about 7,500 to 8,000 words. They're both right in that neighborhood. I find that to be really interesting. But if you start doing like pattern extrapolation and pattern recognition within these texts, one thing you find, for instance, in Marcion's text is that Marcion, uh, I'm sorry, that Paul has hardly any friends. Like he doesn't have a social network. So Paul mentions John and James and Peter, but not by the name Cephas usually, which you find in the canonical form of Paul's letters. So John, James, Peter, the pillars, so-called pillars in Jerusalem. And then he mentions Titus very clearly and maybe Epaphroditus. There's a little bit of dissent, you know, discord about that. Uh, but you know, the other 80, 90 names in the Pauline epistles, they all just disappear. And and these include major characters like Timothy and Barnabas, co-authors like Silvanus, right? Luke, Damos, and, and, but all of his buddies in Caesar's household, 
all of the people in the church at Rome that just disappears. And, and our Dr. Father Harry Gamble was, you know, when he's researched, you know, carefully Romans 15 and 16 and found that that content um, is sometimes missing from early manuscripts of, Ro of Romans, particularly in the Latin tradition. So it may have been a originally a separate letter. But if you look at Marcion's Paul, and, you know, again, Marcion was a devotee of Paul. And yet the, the picture we're getting of Paul, if you just take Marcion scriptures as the basis, is that Paul has a very minimal social network. It's just him and Titus. There's no huge entourage. There's no emphasis on tradition and succession. And when you start to really interrogate the sources in the second century, like Irenaeus, he's interested in things like apostolic succession. He's interested in genealogies of orthodoxy. So to me, I see much closer affinities between what Irenaeus is doing and the canonical forms of the Pauline letters that Paul has this massive entourage. He is, you know, mentoring Timothy, Titus, he's mentoring Titus. These are successors and they pass on his legacy and his inheritance. And, and when you look at the Marcionite version and see like, there's no Timothy, <laughs> there's no Titus. I'm sorry, there's no, there, there's Titus, there's no Barnabas, right? So major players. And then those players happen to show up very frequently in Acts. And those references in Acts tend to be highly uh, chunked or, you know, they coalesce, particularly around chapters 16 to 20. So uh, there's all these name references in Acts 16 to 20, and then in, in the canonical versions of Paul that are just completely missing. So if you, if you read my, it's on, it's on Zenodo, it's called uh, Paul's Literary Metamorphosis, this preliminary translation. So Marcus has invited me to submit it to Studia Patristica, so that's what we'll do. Once he's completely finished his refinement of Marcion's Apostolos, which is a, a process, and I've been working with him uh, on it. He's been working on it for years and years and years, but I've been working on it with him uh, closely for the last about eight, nine months. So once he's finished his refinement, uh, I'll adjust the English translation accordingly. But you can already, if you if you look at the translation I have in the introduction, you can already get a pretty decent sense. And then you can compare that with the Dunes version. And and just, uh, you know, that I mean, the main thing is really just start to take these texts seriously. Like, why why is Marcion such a curiosity? It's like we it's like one of those Gnostic creatures we go and look at at the zoo, and then we go home and we live the rest of our lives. Why aren't we interrogating these texts? seriously on their own terms even if yeah there there's there's you know not complete clarity and there's not complete agreement but that doesn't mean they weren't real and that we shouldn't take them seriously and then they take them seriously in comparison with the canonical text that's right because if marcin's first if he's the first new testament then all the canonical versions are in some sense based on his work based on that fundamental idea of christians saying hey you know the Old Testament isn't scripture in the sense that the New Testament is. That's fundamentally a Marcionite idea, that prioritizing of, the, of what he calls the New Testament. The New Testament for him is better. It's got better promises, and it makes everything else stand out like a shadow. Um, so, And even though Marcion's New Testament is only 11 books, he sets the pattern and the structure for every other single iteration of, of the New Testament, every other single version of the New Testament, and there are many, okay, mind you, um, is going to start with a gospel and then is going to move on to epistles, uh, usually Pauline epistles. And then as the New Testament grows, and it grows over the course of centuries until we get basically to the, the final iterations in the fourth century, it grows from 11 to 27 books eventually. Um, in some manuscripts, it seems to have had more. If you look at, many, you know, Sinaiticus, um, I believe it's got Barnabas. And uh, some people thought the Shepherd of Hermas should, should have been in the New Testament apparently. But eventually they, they got it to 27. So going from 11 to 27, that's significant. But the structure is, is similar. And, and the structure is... Life of Jesus plus Letters of Paul, and they're all consistent. And Marcion's text is, in that sense, structurally the basis. And it's significant also that Marcion's text is the basis for canonical Luke, right? So there's no single manuscript of canonical Luke that doesn't in some way go back to Marcion's original instantiation of that, because the theory of Marcion's priority says that his gospel came first and that the canonical Luke is a, uh, a revision of that. 
and it's a very intentional revision. It has a editorial tendency, which is an anti marciani editorial tendency. And that from my perspective, according to my theory anyway, I don't know if Mark agrees, but whoever is editing Luke in an anti marciani direction is also writing Acts. And so the final product, that final diptych, um, is that editor, probably working in Rome, I think, in the mid-2nd century, trying to revise Marcion's gospel as well as his version of church history so as to reclaim Paul for these incipient Catholics. Um, That's right. We yeah. need to move I, on. I would agree with that. Could, oh. could I just spell out a little bit more? I just mentioned a couple of things. One, yeah, one thing quick, might yep. be to, to take texts like the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which have many iterations and many subsections, but to take that more seriously as a viable, popular, not just fan fiction, but a, a, something that might have been considered on the level of canonical Luke in uh, and, and canonical Acts in certain audiences. And if you look at the Acts of Paul and Thecla, its picture of Paul is much closer to Marcion's picture of Paul as somebody who's a radical preacher of virginity, for instance. Mm -hmm which is also right. closer to the picture of Jesus in certain gospels. But the other big thing, and th this this is where if you take Marcin, Marcinite priority seriously, it shakes up New Testament studies to its foundation because all the theories of Q, Farrer, I have none of those take Marcinite text seriously and, and Marcinite priority seriously. So if Marcin's gospel is before Luke, then using canonical Luke to try to establish Q is a fool's errand and, and, and the wrong approach to take completely. You're using a massively contaminated text that was using many, many sources, five, six, seven, who knows how many sources canonical Luke was using versus a, an earlier, simpler, simpler gospel. And people like Jason Badoon, Pierangelo Grimaglia, Daniel Smith, I think is of this view as a Kloppenberg protege. Um, and I, we, we're all of the view that Marston's gospel looks like a pretty simple two source gospel. And so, that's actually how we get back to Q. If there was a Q, and right, we can debate about that, but do we use canonical Luke to get to Q, canonical Luke and Matthew, or do we use Marcion's gospel to get us to Q? And and David's brought up, you know, this theme of the poor in Marcion's life, but it, you know, it's it's all throughout his scriptures. And that is pretty consistent with what scholars have generally thought about the content of Q. It's it's the beggar's gospel, it's the gospel of the poor. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. So I'm going to go now to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, we have next uh, Victor De La Rosa, um, who asks me, um, are demons a pure Christian invention, or do you think they show up in the Old Testament as well? Well, so demons is, is kind of this broad overarching kind of category for any sort of negatively colored divine being. And if we have that broad based big tent definition of a demon, then demons go way back, um, much earlier even than the Old Testament. I mean, we, we have Sumerian and Akkadian literature that mentions uh, hostile divine forces, which could be categorized as demonic. Uh, if, if you've read the Enuma Elish, I mean, you might even think of uh, some of these rebel gods um, uh, or second tier or middle management deities as uh, as demons. But the word demon uh, just is, is a transliteration of the Greek word daimon or daimon, and uh, daimones is in the plural. So uh, Christians definitely aren't inventing those. That, that's all over Greek literature. Um, when daimon comes into Christian literature, and you can read more about this in, I've got a book, Post-Human Transformation, Becoming Angels and Demons. When daimones enter Christian literature, you often find that daimones has become daimonia, which is like a, a sort of a negatively nuanced diminutive that Christians use to refer to them. And they are always classed as negative. Whereas in Greek literature, like if you read Plato, for instance, a daimon is a fairly ambiguous being, um, a trickster perhaps, but not necessarily all bad or all good. Um, but they are that be a, a, middle a, management. A, a, it can either you daimon, you you daimon can mean a positive attribution of a person, somebody who's got a good spirit or a good a good demon, somebody's like good 
has a good spiritual inclination, we might say, as you uh, as you daimon, right? So it's, yep, you daimon. It's, yeah, it can be used com- of people. Common as well. Greek word. Yeah, common Greek word. It means happy. It means you've got you've got a good angel, as we would say, a good guardian angel. So if you're eudaimonic, you're you're happy, or you're blessed, or you're content. You've got a good life. Um, I hope that gets to most of your question there, Victor. Again, thank you very much um, for for posing it. So uh, I have a question here from, uh, again, uh, just correct me if I'm not in the right order here. Um, Let's see, Michael E., um, even some atheist thinkers like Nietzsche, Badu, and Zizek saw something historically profound about the Christ event and ideologically distinctive about the Christian Christian message in the first century. Your view. Um, again, these great philosophers saw something historically profound about the Christ event and ideologically distinctive about the Christian message. Um, Mark, do you want to take a stab at that? Or, or <laughs> I shall take I? take a little uh, bit. Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, give, I'll let... give a little go. But, okay. Uh, not, not my area of expertise. Um, it is interesting to me that Nietzsche criticized, uh, in this twilight of the Antichrist, criticized Christianity as a slave religion. Uh, that's interesting, given the, the topics that we've been discussing today. Um, Zizek, I'm just not sure how to interpret his his thought at all. He's just so eclectic and 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 compl- complex that I, I just wouldn't know. I did see him live, though. I will say that it was fun to... Uh, I was taking class with John Milbank at UVA on Neoplatonism, and uh, one of Milbank's students brought Zizek to campus, and Milbank and Zizek gesticulated furiously with each other on the stage for, for the better part of an hour, and I'm not sure that most of us understood what was going on. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, Matt. <laughs> Well, yeah. So I, I think, you know, as in as in any discipline and we're trying to study, you know, we're, we're trying to study religion um, or early Christianity here, just like we would study anything else, including rocks and trees. Uh, it's a secular study. And that's our approach. We are definitely in the minority for scholars who who do that. Um, I always say, you know, we need a few good atheists in the field of New Testament. And um we don't have a lot, um, maybe for obvious sociological reasons, but we want to do this as rigorously and as social scientifically as we can. Um, it's it's not a science, it's not a hard science, but the first thing that I would say here is that we need to look at all the diversity of different forms of Christianity. If you want to say, oh, were well, there something unique or distinctive? about Christianity as that abstract term, well, um, I would say to you, uh, maybe not talk so abstractly, maybe let's talk about individual Christians, because as we have today, we've got dozens, perhaps even hundreds of different Christian groups with modifications made to their theology, to their ethics, to their ritual, and there's no essence of Christianity or at least I would say that. I mean, there's, there's like some people would just say, oh, well, Jesus, duh. But uh, actually, you know, Jesus has a million faces too. And if Jesus has a million faces, then so does his followers, right? And and, and even more so, because they are the one imagining those million different Jesuses. You know, I, um, I often kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> I laugh to myself often because the, the whole issue of, you know, finding Jesus is... is 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 really, you know, which Jesus and which Christianity, which is the one you're referring to? Because there were there were many, and um, so if we find something distinctive about, let's just say, Marcionite, the Marcionite version of Christianity, well, I would say something that he, one could one could in fact say that Marcion was one of those inventors of Christianity. And and I say that um, as part of a larger debate that scholars make about, you know, well, what is Judaism and is what is Christianity? And, and when did Christianity become Christianity? Because 99% of us are agreed that, you know, first century Christianity was just a variation on, on Judaism. And even Paul, you know, for as much as he was pushing the distinctive non-circumcising kind of a gospel, 
never stepped out of Judaism, never said he was a Christian, he wasn't familiar with the term. Um, and now we have swaths and swaths of scholars to, you know, trying to fit Paul back into Judaism. And, uh, you know, Jesus and Judaism, you know, that it's what we hear like uh, ad nauseum today. So that's all true. And what, what makes Marcion distinctive, though, is that philosophically, he says, God is only good. Okay. And therefore, any story about God that you read anywhere, including the Old Testament, which depicts a God who's angry or vengeful or wrathful or making evils, that's not God. Okay. And that the Old Testament scriptures aren't the scriptures for Christians. Those are the scriptures for Jews. And that's a very distinctive, that's a very distinctive move. Marcion is the very first who says, we need our own scriptures. We don't need Isaiah and Jeremiah. Now he doesn't necessarily like totally discount those and say, don't read those books. Um, I mean, he clearly read them himself. He doesn't reject the Old Testament in that sense, but he does. But he says that for Christians, our authority is Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus brings a new revelation of a new deity, and that's why we're no longer Jews. Um, and and I think you know some people have made the great mistake of then saying, oh well, okay, so Marcion is then anti-Jewish, not at all. For someone who tries to make a rigorous distinction between the followers of Jesus, the Messiah, and Judaism, that person is not necessarily anti-Jewish. That person is trying to show a distinction. And there's not a single bad word that Marcin says against Jews specifically, even though he's die hard. And in fact, he agrees with Tertullian on this point raised by Mark that books like Galatians or letters like Galatians are manifestos against Judaism or they're manifestos for devalidating the law by which is meant the Torah as valid for, for Christian life and ethics. It was the Sermon on the Plain, uh, or whatever we want to call it, that was the new law for Marcion, the new Torah. And he said that the Mosaic Torah is no longer uh, needed. It's it's deficient. And that is very highly distinctive. And he's he's the first that really pushes that through in a major way. So that's what I would say. Obviously, other forms of Christianity, be, Christianity are going to be distinctive in different ways. But uh, since we're a little bit short on time, um, I've got to go to the Can next I question. Follow just a little bit more on that one. Yep. Yeah. Just a minute more. Oh, so, we... yep. We have two more two more questions after this so far that come in. Christ, the, the term Christ event as well, I would want to interrogate and question that concept a little bit too, to say, where is that phrase coming from, that concept? It, to me, it, it's reminiscent of Bonhoeffer. It's re reminiscent of Bart. It's re uh, reminiscent of Ernst Kesemann and their understanding of this descent of, of Jesus as this sort of pivotal moment in history. And that that filters into you know later certainly in in the writings of Eusebius or uh, Dionysius the Little like there's a, there's a lot of examples of understanding Jesus as sort of a pivot point of history so and and our whole system of time of course is in the Gregorian calendar is built on that so we sort of have an innate bias I think to see Jesus of Nazareth as a pivotal person um, it may be though that Marcion points us more in the direction of the rupture one of the bigger ruptures was Hadrian. Uh, not, not just the destruction of the temple, but his anti-Jewish policies may have been the context in which Marcionism arose as a distinctive messianic movement that was trying to move beyond Hebraic understandings and uses of scripture. Um, but when, you know, if you look at, if you read the work, you know, work of lots of people, John Collins or James Tabor would be examples of this. Jesus fits right within many common trends uh, of of his day as a as a messianic candidate, as a wonder worker, uh, as a as an interpreter of Torah, teacher of righteousness. There's all as well as the Greco-Roman mythologies, right? There, there's many, many, many categories we could use, and I think evolution or change is the norm. And so, but if we can think about evolution as sort of the broader norm, and then occasional ruptures rather than Christ events, ruptures. I, but I think Hadrian. And it's not to say that the historical Jesus wasn't significant, but I, I tend to think of it more as um, a, a rupture in that particular moment in time of, of outrage 
about the death, unjust death of this this person and a movement that grew out of that. Um, but I'm sorry, let's go to the next question. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Ed. Uh, and uh, I, I apologize if we're, we, we only planned for an hour. Of, so, but <laughs> um, I, I'm so glad to see that people are, are interested. Um, and I, I just want to put in a little remark here that, um, you know, Mark and I are currently working on Marcian. Marcian is going to be my book project. So all the the support and the, the donations that you give are, are going towards supporting us. We're not, you know, heavy hitting scholars in, in you know, big name institutions. We are just trying to do good work um, in a field where it's kind of hard to survive right now. So I just want to say thank you to all for your support and for helping us get the word out. So um, our, our next question is from, let's see, ATL. Um, how did Roman authorities view Christianity and Christians during Marcion's life there? Was he keeping a low profile, operating in secret? Uh, I'll just say a little word and, and then go to Mark here. Um, that there's nothing secret about Marcy, and I, I don't think. Actually, secrecy is not really too much of a theme. And he, he comes to Rome um, making this big donation. He wants everyone to know who he is, and uh, he wants people to know. Um, I think when he publishes his New Testament, um, you know, I envision it sort of like um, a bit like Martin Luther in the 95 Theses. I know that people, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm not trying to say he was Luther or proto-Luther or anything like that, but it was a big event and uh, I, it shook it shook the Christian community. Um and, and, you know, we have, you know, 15 different treatises written against Marcion in the space of 50 years. I mean, they're, they're panicking. They're panicking. Um, but interestingly, the, the only person uh, that comes to my mind that talks about Roman authorities in Marcion um, is, uh, is Justin. And Justin Martyr says, um, and writes to, in his first apology, he says to the Roman authorities, hey, I noticed that you're persecuting our group, but there's these other people called Marcionites, and they're the guys you should be persecuting. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, it's like one Christian backstabbing the other, basically. Um, and um, this is actually, sadly, a common theme among Christians that, you know, the, the, the people who reported other Christians to the Romans were other Christians. <laughs> So, I mean, in some cases, that 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 was that was the case, um, because it, it's the Christians who squabbled most uh, uh, amongst each other, and actually, the Roman authorities don't really take too much notice um, that we can that we can tell. I mean, you know, episodes like Pliny and you know the 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 Decian persecution; these these are like blips in in the wide field of history where Roman emperors. You know, and, and other high religious officials in Rome are just doing their own thing, and they don't seem to notice this tiny sect. And really, who would? I mean, would you notice, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses in your town unless they came knocking on your door? I mean, it's sort of like that. Anyway, Mark, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I think the the terminology here it, it's helpful to to think uh, critically about it. So the word Christian, for instance, doesn't show up in Marcion scriptures at all. Right. So would that term even be applicable to him and his followers in the 120s, 130s and, and that time period? When you read Acts, it's ambiguous, uh, like prevaricating about whether to use the term Christian or not. In some ways, having an etymology for it and other ways seem seeming quite reluctant to even use that term. Um, Pliny is the first person in the historical record to use that term. And again, I think it just means messianics, not some distinctive religion called Christianity. So by the time of Justin, you may have something like the notion of Christianity as a as a as a cult, a cult, uh, you know, a ritual practice that's distinctive from Judaism, and then internecine rivalries among rival groups in Rome uh, around the mid second century. So what what Romans thought about Christianity during Marcion's life is, is an anachronistic question because there were there was no such thing as Christianity. And in that case, I, I would want to balance it out a little bit saying in some ways we might have small inconsequential guild-like religions. Um, but, you know, Trajan, for instance, knew the danger potentially of guilds 
getting involved in seditious kinds of things in in local politics occasionally. Um, and uh, what I want to say about that, I'll, I'll just move it on to you, David. I'll, I'll maybe come back to that later. Okay. Okay. Um, well, again, thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm going to bring it to Pedro. Uh, thank you so much, Pedro, for your question and your super chat. Um, what are your opinions on the supposed docetism that Marcion supported? How does this relate on how the heresiologist looked at his canon? Well, this is a super important question. And again, I'll just say a brief word and let um, uh, Mark uh, take over from there. The idea that Marcion was a docetist is a heresiological fable as far as I'm concerned. You see this again and again and again in Mars in, in Tertullian. Uh, but it's funny the way that Tertullian deals with it. So Tertullian has this dogma in his head that Marcin thinks that Jesus's body is a kind of apparition or, or phantasm, as he says. And as he's going through Marcion's gospel, you know, you know, time after time, he's like, well, this shouldn't be here because Jesus's body is not actually supposed to be solid. But according to the story of him preaching in Nazareth, they grabbed him, they pushed him to the brow of a hill, and they were about to throw him off. That just doesn't happen to an apparition. I don't know what's going on here. And, and it's funny to watch Tertullian kind of struggle with these passages because, again, it's that rule which I said at the beginning of our uh, sort of fireside chat here, is that the 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 standard for understanding Marcion's theology and his view of Jesus is not what the heresiologists say, okay? It is his gospel and the uh, Pauline letters, okay? And that's where you have to begin. So it's absolutely clear from the gospel that Marcion does not and never viewed Christ as an, Jesus as an apparition, or phantasm, okay? And there's this fantastic article by um, David Wilhite, which I can recommend to you. Um, it's called, um, well, I forget the exact name, but if you look, look up David Wilhite on Marcion, you just put that into Google Scholar. That's W-I-L-H-I-T-E. He talks about Marcion and, and, and so-called docetism. But there are passages in the Pauline letters where at least a couple times Paul says that he Jesus came in the likeness of human beings, um, and uh, or in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's that's in Romans, and um, I'm I'm open to, um, it, you know, Mar we don't have a clear statement from Marcion, but I'm open to the view that Marcion did think that G there was something special about Jesus's flesh, that it wasn't exactly made of the same protons and neutrons as our flesh, but regardless of how regardless of its actual composition it was something solid you know you couldn't just put your hand through it you know like i hear i'm on zoom you know and I, I'm, I'm disappearing you know um that's not <laughs> how he thought of it um or, or you know let me let me do this yeah okay so that's an apparition <laughs> okay that's an apparition okay but but actually that's not Marcin's view he, he may have viewed his his, the, his substance of his flesh different differently um, interestingly Apelles who's Marcin's disciple is much more clear on this point he says that actually um, Jesus made his own body by a special mixture of the four elements and um, so he wasn't actually born the way that you and I were. Uh, but I read this as a development of, of, of what Marcion uh, was, was saying. I, I don't think this is necessarily Marcion's view. Anyway, go read that article. Mark, um, jump on yeah, here. I, yeah, I, th I would agree with everything you just said. And um, the only things I would add is uh, Tertullian tries to make mountains out of molehills in Marcion's gospel. So Jesus is eating, Jesus is walking, Jesus is doing human things. But just because Jesus descends out of heaven uh, in the in the start of Marcion's gospel, and just because it happens to use a, a slightly different word in Greek, uh, phantasma, but that's what the disciples think when they see Jesus. They think he was a phantasma, right? But he actually breaks bread with them. So he's also trying to basically, you know, he's he's an inheritor of the longer version of the resurrection stories you find in canonical luke as well as john whereas they're this you know 
uh, great emphasis on the physicality of the resurrection body of Jesus, which goes together in Acts with Paul's defense of the resurrection of the body. That it's basically portraying, I think, sort of nascent Christianity as a sort of post pharisaic movement as the true heirs of the Pharisees, you might say that Paul was a Pharisee and, and inheriting that, keeping with that, those traditions, and then using that to try to defend sort of a unitary view of God. And they saw Marcion, they care, and, and David has a great article in this, that Marcion was not a, a ditheist, uh, but they're trying to caricature him as a ditheist. And for that reason, they also want to caricature him as a docetist, but he probably was neither of those. Right. There's a very funny passage also in Tertullian where he gets to the end of Marcion's gospel and he gets to the point where Jesus, who's resurrected, says to the disciples, well, look at me. I I'm showing you my hands and my feet and a spirit doesn't have bones like I have. And Tertullian is just like, OK, hold yeah. on. He should not have <laughs> said that. He should not have said that because he shouldn't have bones in the first place. And then Jesus, again, in Marcion's gospel, says, hey, you got anything to eat? And they give him a piece of broiled fish. And he's like, hey, here's my teeth. I don't know. I don't know. OK. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so, you know, it's it's clear that Marcion thought that Jesus was solid and substantial. And it's Tertullian who is pissing his own pants when he realizes that everything he's dogmatically kind of believed about what Marcion thinks, and keep in mind that Tertullian is about 50 years after Marcion, um, that he realizes that it's not going to work, right? Uh, and so he, he, he gets, uh, you know, into all these weird, you know, arguments. And, and it, it's fun reading Tertullian, okay, but you don't believe everything that you read. And I think everybody knows that, you know, and, and we're, as scholars, you know, I, I, I can't speak for Mark, but, you know, we want to make everybody a good and critical reader, not just of the New Testament and of other documents, but we want to introduce people to other kinds of early Christian literature. It is highly rhetorical literature, highly polemicized, and we want to teach people to read that kind of stuff because we can, you know, after lots of hard work and blood and sweat, you know, get the good um, the gold nuggets out of that, so to speak, but it takes it takes labor. And the unfortunate thing about Marcionite studies in the past, in the 20th century, is that people have taken a basically a heresiological perspective and said, oh, okay, Tertullian says Marcion was a docetist. Okay, well, I guess he was then. And then not allowing... Um, not allowing for Marcion's gospel himself to speak. So we've got one final, we'll take one final question. Um, and actually, Mark, I'm going to let you take this from John D. Um, what are your opinions on whether or not Marcin redacted his gospel? This is right up your alley, Mark. Yeah, sure. Um, what what I've been finding, and I've been looking at this and have, have an open science book, if you want to get into the thick of the weeds on the patristic attestations and brief reconstructions and all that. And I've, I've published um, Greek editions to uh, data sets of all the past reconstructions of Marcion's gospel. So you can now compare them, uh, you know, very, very carefully. And they're very, very different, all the reconstructions. But um, in any case, to the to this particular question, did Marcion redact his gospel? That is certainly what Tertullian and other Orthodox apologists want us to believe about him. Uh, it's just that there's hardly any real evidence for that, you know, because all, all, all the, usually it, it amounts to a case that Marcion was cutting out the Jewish scriptures but then if you actually read Marcion's gospel, you find that he's continuously referencing the Jewish scriptures in a positive way. So what, what Marcion's gospel is lacking is a bunch of proof texting, salvation historical uh, explanations and e expansions of the Jesus tradition where Jesus did this to fulfill this prophecy and Jesus did this to fulfill this prophecy. And that's that's the redaction. So all, all that salvation historical Septuagintal layering into the story of Jesus. That's the redaction. Uh, Mar Marcion may have had, you know, Jason Badoon has a great um, chapter article on this called The Myth of Marcion as Redactor. So I'd encourage you to read that. And he, he makes the case that there's just, it doesn't, it just doesn't align everything that we know from the heresiologists about Marcion's belief just doesn't align with his gospel and any kind of consistent program. But if you actually look at his gospel on its own terms, it does look like a redaction in the sense that it was an it was a coherent editorial program um, with some some elements that were new to it. 
So what, what I and Badoon and other people see is that it was a two source gospel that was stitched together and some new things, maybe like the introduction about the 15th year of Tiberius, that was probably part of the initial redaction. Marcion probably didn't, wasn't the one to do that. It, it was probably before him. Other stories like the, the blind man at Bethsaida, that might've been a later addition to, to Marcion's gospel. And, and it, it was in a process of evolution. So you can look at certain sayings and uh, they grow over time. Luke 6, 5, there's a much longer version, for instance, in Klinghart's version of the Evangelion that you'll find, then you'll find in the other versions because he he sees this and it's been chalked up to Marcionite. So the Marcionites weren't, they were just like the proto-Orthodox, the Catholic interpreters, where they were constantly putting new stuff in their texts. So it's not like it was a static text. So it was constantly being redacted. But do we have any evidence of Marcion carrying out any kind of serious redactional or editorial program. No, that's that's just heresiology that, that in terms of what I, th I think what the critical scholarly consensus is uh, around this, even though like you know, it's hard to talk about consensus with <laughs> with humanist or humanity scholars. But. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for their interest. Uh, John D, thank you for your super chat. We, uh, we do have one more. I don't want to um, shut anyone down um, uh, from Elias. I hope I'm not butchering that. Uh, thank you so much for your super, super chat. Uh, Badoon mentioned that all the references in the antitheses were Mathean. And the question is, were Ebionites aware of Marcion and did they interact? Um, uh, Mark, I, I don't know. What do you What do you think? Um, that that's I need to look at that. That's all new to me. I hadn't taken note of that. I mean, I, I work well, you know a lot with Badoon, but I haven't um, I haven't taken note of that particular observation, and I haven't tried to correlate the attestations about the Ebionites and you know Gospel of the Hebrews, for instance, with the Marcionite text. So to me, that's pointing where research needs to go. I also, just noticed Jody McCollum uh, or Joey McCollum from. Uh, Australian Catholic University, formerly, right? And, uh, or, or currently, currently, there's a colleague of yours there. He's, he's in the chat. So Joey does amazing work on uh, phylogenetics, phylogenetic approaches to uh, gospel manuscripts. So if you haven't looked at his work, it's, it's crazy brilliant. Yes, welcome, Joey. Um, and uh, Joey also has a translation of the Acts of John. Um, let me say a little bit more, um, Elias. I, um, I think, uh, and I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure which, which Badoon article or book you're referring to, but um, I think it's probably fairly clear that Marcion knew the Matthean antitheses um, in the sense that his own work called the antitheses follows the structure of, you know, here's something in the Old Testament, you know, but I say to you, um, and the kind of, uh, we might call it supersessionary, but I guess that's too negative here, but the, the kind of going beyond, um, what makes Marcion different than the Mithean antitheses is that the Mithean antitheses are saying, you know, in, in some ways, the Jewish law has been subsumed by the new uh, proclamation in, in Christ. Um, but I think what Marcion is saying is that, okay, just look at the texts. Here's something that the God of the Old Testament, you know, I, those aren't politically correct terms anymore, but they actually work well for Marcion. Marcion, I think, did definitely, you know, want to contrast the Old and New Testament. And he said, look at the God of the Old Testament. Look at the things that he does. And then come over here and look at the things that Jesus does, Jesus being the representative, and see the difference in character, right? So that's Marcion's project in the, in the Antitheses. To give just one example, Jesus in the Gospel says, you know, with open arms, let the children come to me, you know, I, and it blesses them, puts his hand on their head, you know, he loves kids, he's great. And then Marcion says, contrast this with what Elisha the prophet does in the book of Kings, where some little kids, and, and they're called little kids, um, they make fun of Elisha's boldness, and Elisha's first response is, Yahweh, you got you take care of this. And all of a sudden, two huge she bears come out of the forest and 
devour the children, cracking their bones and uh, swallowing. And Marcion's, Marcion's point is here, don't you think that these just might be different deities? I, I mean, might be at least different characters because... And, and don't you think that it's at least intellectually insulting to try to harmonize and reconcile these two different approaches to children? Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, that's going way beyond Matthew's a- antitheses. Um, the only thing I would say about Evie Nights is um, I'm not even sure uh, what the kosher word is now, but if we want to call these people Jewish Christians or a type of Jewish Christian, then they're basically on the opposite track that Marcion is. And um, Marcion is on that kind of track where he is trying to distinguish, I think, what we would call in the modern world a new religion that's different from Judaism. And I think what lots of Jewish Christians were doing, even still in Marcion's time, was they were just also following the law of Moses and the oracles of Jesus, and they thought that those were perfectly compatible. And so it's another great example of Christianity is fundamentally different on different tracks. They both view Jesus as Messiah, but they mean totally different things. Totally different things. Um, Let's see, I just two. Okay, uh, so uh, I think um, we're actually over time. um, And I just want to use this opportunity again to thank everybody. Mark, I want to give you the opportunity to plug anything whatsoever you had a couple links i don't know if uh yeah. you wanted yeah, to share you. yeah the places i direct people are i i don't have a youtube channel of my own but i'm co co-managing with jack bull the patristica channel so it's it's fairly new but you'll find some really amazing regular guests there like marcus vincent and jason Badoon and uh i think david's going to be a guest in the future and we'll continue to reach out to other scholars to have interesting conversations uh, mostly about Marcionism, but, uh, you know, early second century, late, late first century Christianity. Um, I have a Patreon, Mark G. Bilby, um, but I'm also on GitHub. And uh, a lot of the work I'm doing these days is on GitHub, um, trying to make these integrations of gospel studies with computational linguistics approaches. So for the coders out there, data scientists, please, please come over to GitHub and, um, you know, start start helping us do data curations, data transformations, data analysis. Um, it's getting easier and easier for the public uh, to be a part of that. So those of you using ChatGPT 4.0 and the data analysis tool, start plugging some of that Marcionite data in there and see what you get and come back to us. Um, I'll have some some pretty, I think, significant announcements later about some happenings in that data science, data curation space, uh, but I'll, I'll leave that for another episode. Thank you again so much, Elizabeth Adams. Thank you for your super sticker. It is so wonderful to see uh, all of you and to see all of you interacting in the chat. I apologize if we did not get to your question. I'm going to try to make this a regular event. Uh, and as I said, you know, Marcin is my next book project on a top of on top of life, um, just surviving life. Um, and um, I, I really appreciate the support. I know that Mark appreciates it as well. Um, we are trying to do the work that others aren't doing and trying, you know, we're not, unfortunately, um, comfortable, you know, sitting in academic chairs where we're just um, two scholars trying to do their best and make it in this world, um, you know, with our families. And it is very, very uh, heartwarming to see all of you. I will try, um, I'll do my best uh, to make these live streams a regular event on my channel. So um, if I can get everything figured out, there's going to be kinks. I I apologize uh, for any kinks in in terms of uh, scheduling these since uh, I'm I'm doing these through Zoom currently. But I just want to thank everybody again for coming along and joining us in our uh, fire side chat. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the uh, interesting features of Zoom, I can uh, get uh, us, you know, by a fire. And so I hope all of you are safe. 
and warm, and I wish all of you a very happy new year um, from, from us. Thank you again. <laughs>